Good day or evening, uh, whatever it is, and welcome to our third episode of our summer series of the Constitution and American Life with us, the Friends of Publius. Uh, as, as I've been in kind of a situation of rehabilitation from a, a health challenge, I have a lot of time to think, and that can be a dangerous uh, factor here, but I was recently thinking about a modern American history and trying to determine uh, if I agree with journalist Tom Brokaw that the generation born in the 1920s and 30s who experienced the Great Depression and participated in World War II merited the title of the greatest generation. I'm still gnawing on that, but I have definitely, I've come to the conclusion that my generation, uh, more commonly known as the boomers, uh, there is definitely, is definitely in competition for the worst generation in American history. Think about it, it's somewhat fascinating that the boomers were leaders in the activism of the 1960s and 70s, movements that attempted to make America more peaceful, more just, and more attuned to the promises of America's first principles. That generation ended up sparking the drug culture, introducing disco music and random divorce, and intensifying American consumerism and materialism to a level that no one could anticipate. It is the boomers who now control the lever levers of power in most of our institutions and have put the United States on a crash course, if you paid attention to the Texas Republican Convention this last uh, weekend, uh, with another civil war. I am so proud of myself and my generation, I just get all giddy about that. In light of that observation, today we are going to be discussing constitutional and political change that attempted to further the ideals contained in the Declaration of Independence. I think more succinctly, we hope to address what I consider maybe one of the more important questions uh, Americans face regarding the nature of our constitutional system. Is the Constitution a living Constitution, or is it, in the words of former Justice Anthony Scalia, a dead Constitution? And so I'm wondering, gentlemen, from your perspective, real briefly, what is it? Is it, is it a living Constitution or a dead Constitution uh, from your perspective? Professor Williams, what's your take on that? Uh, it's definitely a living Constitution to the extent that it, it the Constitution constitutes um, not abstract ideas or principles, it constitutes a society trying to live together. And to the extent that human beings were always in the state of change, I think the way you described the boomers, I don't know if I'll agree or disagree with it being the worst generation or tied, but it's definitely a generation that taught us um, there are cycles, right? There's a, a pushing for change and then the cycle goes back and there's kind of an acceptance of the status quo. And um, I think, as societies do that and as the constitution has to sort of move with those flows or it becomes antiquated very quickly. Chris? Um, living, in spite of Justice Antonin Scalia, the late Antonin Scalia and his saying it has no heart or lungs or legs or comparing it, it's, it's definitely a living document. And the idea that we can't use it to to reflect the time period in which we live and that we're gonna be beholden to uh, the words as they were understood in 1787 or 1788 or 1791 um, is kind of ludicrous. And I think that, and I don't know the founders personally or the framers personally, though I know a couple of you guys pretty well. Um, I, I think that they would think it's ludicrous as well to think that we would be governed by their words and not the world in which we live. Professor Moore? I, well, I think, um, uh, I think there's a little, I think there's a little sleight of hand and, and I know for many, many years, uh, uh, Justice Scalia went around on the lecture circuit and, and uh, he, he always got great laughs with, uh, I guess I'm here to tonight to defend the dead constitution. Uh, and uh, so, so I do, I do think there's, I, I think there's a little sleight of hand in his, uh, his glibness about that. Cause it seems to me that no matter what your mode of interpretation of the constitution is, there's interpretation. 
you know, so if, if like, for example, if you go with original intent, you, you have to divine, or you have to interpret. So all uh, most schemes of jurisprudence are living in the sense that they're doing interpretation. Uh, so that so that's why I think um, the living versus the dead constitution is is a little bit um, too ham handed. All methods of dealing with the constitution, you have to do some interpretation. To me, there's an element of living in all of them. Well, I did I did read in total one of his presentations where he talked as as uh, you acknowledged about this notion of the dead constitution. And, and Chris, he, you know, he, he obviously says, you know, the framers created a mechanism for change, and that is the amendment. And that's, you know, that's, to him, that's pretty much the only tool in the toolbox. If, if a generation wants to change meaning, they have the amendment process. What I'm curious, uh, Chris, about is, you know, given what our topic is, and obviously we're going to be looking at maybe a variety of tools could you take a, a brief moment and kind of list out what are the other tools that, you know, that allow for change uh, other than um, the amendment process? Well, I'd say uh, probably the easiest one is um, interpretation by the, the courts. Um, and, you know, we've used this uh, probably on other episodes, but if you think about in 1896 and the Plessy case, which uh, according to Amar, Akil Amar belongs in the pits of constitutional hell, along with a couple of other cases um, that uh, you fast forward to Brown in 1954. There are no new laws, right? There are no new, no new amendments. They have the same laws. They have the same amendments, but it allows the court to interpret the time and change. So I think uh, without an amendment, same thing is true. And uh, if you go from, uh, um, Bowers v. Hardwick to Lawrence v. Texas to um, Obergefell v. Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage, right? Um, it, it, so it's, I think it shows that the uh, constitutional interpretation by the courts uh, certainly opens it up to change. Well, okay, so we've got judicial review, and I, I sense from what you and Tim have mentioned that that's maybe you know, a major tool beyond uh, beyond the amendment process, and maybe the tool that Scalia was uh, you know, maybe most frustrated with. But are there any other tools, uh, Professor Williams, that that you you'd recognize as being used to uh, change uh, the Constitution uh, in order to fulfill the values and ideals found in the Declaration? I mean, is Congress a tool to change? Yeah, it is. I mean. Yeah, political power is a tool, not, not to necessarily maybe change the Constitution, but the Constitution allows space for political actors to make decisions on, based on what people want. And there's space in there for members of Congress and for the president to sign on to adopt policies that you could argue might further our commitment to human dignity and liberty. And there's room for lawmakers to make decisions that would not do that. And so while it doesn't change maybe the nature of the constitution, the constitution, um, you know, it's not a Napoleonic code. It doesn't subscribe what we do in every situation. So to the extent that lawmakers want to fill in the gray spaces, right, with, with policies, there's definitely room to do that. And I think over time as members of society become comfortable, like they see that those policies work, I think that does then get to Chris's point, it provides a reimagination of what the constitution then allows, like a, a legitimation of, yeah, Congress can do this and it's within the constitutional bounds because we've tried it and it's been working. Yeah, and I, and, and I wonder to what degree, Professor Moore, state legislatures are a tool. Are the sure, states I, a tool? I'd, um, I'd like to uh, pose a que um, the proposition that, uh, in a way, executive orders and even the veto in some ways are interpretive tools. Because they certainly, uh, if, like, for example, in a veto, it's got to go back to Congress and they got to, you know, they got to muster up votes or, or not muster up votes. So there's some discussion that takes place 
um, even as, as something as a veto. And, and I would suggest some presidential orders border on the interpretive uh, framework. And, and also, there are occasionally there are laws that Congress passes. There, they put prefaces on these laws. And it, it kind of strikes me as Congress is saying, you know, we're, we, we may be out on a limb here with this law. We may we not may not have firm ground to stand on here in Article One, Section Eight. So th these prefaces kind of lay out the constitutional basis, which is basically them doing interpretive work before they get to the actual uh, substance of the law they're passing. So I think Congress itself, in these prefaces to some of these statutes, are doing interpretation as well. David, let Go me ahead, jump Chris. in real quickly. Uh, in addition to executive orders, which I could think of like uh, Truman uh, uh, integrating the armed forces, you know, that was a big one. Uh, and certainly agreeing with what Tim said, but there's also under the, uh, under the executive branch is prosecutorial discretion. Right. Because with the take care clause, the, you know, the, the president is charged with taking care that the laws be faithfully executed. But he also is given a budget by Congress and he's allowed to set up agencies. And he's, and we you know we're not going to get into the administrative state now, but the idea that these agencies then can actually pursue enforcing the law based upon what they, their discretion is. So that allows for some space as well. Um, I think the other thing, when listening to Mike speak, I, I was channeling my inner, I had this Sue Leeson voice in my head. And uh, for those folks watching the program, Sue Leeson has been a, one of the founding mothers of this program and one of the, the co-authors of the textbook and a, and a friend of, I'd say a friend of ours, I would say that'd be safe to say. She always talked about um, the black letter law in the constitution and the white space between the black letter law. You know, like how old do you have to be to be in Congress? Well, there's no debate about that. How old do you have to be to be president? There's no debate about that. That's black letter law. But when it says Congress can establish federal courts, how many? I don't know. Where are they going to be? I don't know. So that's that, that room for, uh, you know, interpretation. So, big C, she called, I'm sorry, she called the big C constitutionalism and small C constitutionalism, which I really like that idea. So uh, interesting enough, as we talk about uh, what is uh, framed as unit three in the We the People textbook, it kind of starts out really with the Civil War as the impetus of a lot of change uh, through a number of the tools that we've talked about. And I am curious, Professor Moore, when we look at the issues that divided this country, you know, and it wasn't overnight, that it kind of evolved into major issues of division by 1861, I am curious as to what degree the framers anticipated these problems. That is, would it have surprised any of the major figures at Philadelphia or during ratification if they had the, the ability to go to 1860, 1861, would they have been surprised by uh, what uh, was developing? Um, in a way, I, I don't think they would. I mean, in the 1780s, there were tremendous um, divisions amongst folks about Western lands. Um, you know, do, should states cede them to the national government before they ratify the articles? I mean, so, so Western lands was a big issue. When you, you get into the uh, Mexican session, post-Mexican session, Western lands are a big issue, the status of the, uh, of the West. So I think there's a geographic set of divisions in the, uh, in the founding period that kind of persists. I, I think there's certainly cultural divisions. The North is culturally different than the South. Uh, a commercial um, enterprise versus an agrarian enterprise. Now that also, uh, that, that ties into a commercial divisions within the country at the founding too. I think um, the political divisions, there's, there's the, the big city folks and the rural, the rural folks. I mean, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know if they really were honest that they, you know, they would say, well, we don't recognize any of these problems, because I think they, in some ways, are there at the founding. Well, would you agree that both in their language and in their writing that they did uh, anticipate a, 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 a potential huge problem oh, sure. with the, with the inst institution of slavery? Oh, absolutely. And, it, and there's a lot of great quotations out there, most, most famously Jefferson's, you know, uh, I, I tremble for my country and wolf, wolf by the ears and um, so, yeah, I mean, they, uh, 
they they would not be they, where they'd be surprised frankly is that it took that long i, I think uh, well i don't know if you have the ability to be inside the minds of the framers although you spend a heck of a lot of time with them in your normal life uh <laughs> there uh but you know did, <laughs> that's a normal life <laughs> well, in, in your normal life, we've discussed that before. I mean, why would anybody study this for a, for a living uh, kind of stuff? But you do. Um, but I, I, what is, you know, what is your thoughts about, they understood some of these problems, and in designing and structuring, you know, framing this constitution, what, how, how did they think it, it, it would be worked out? Did they, did they just think there would be cultural change? I mean, we know we have the 1808 uh, clause right. there, uh, and that gives us some insights into they were thinking ahead uh, on that. Uh, but I am wondering, it was it that was were they like Scalia, and that is well, the future generations will work this out through amendments. Well, and I think uh, I think they did, and and that may. Um, and many historians say that was the naivete of, of the founding generation. I mean, there's a, there's a great book written by Michael Holt uh, about the political crisis of the 1850s. And essentially the thesis is there is no way in, in heck, I mean, as hard as they tried uh, in the 1850s, there was no way they could solve that issue of slavery. Uh, as much bargaining as they tried and their, uh, so, so I think, that's the founder's naivete regarding the slavery piece. Well, I would, I would, I would say, um, I would jump in with like, uh, for students that have access to Madison's notes, even Madison in his notes says the division is not going to be between the large states and right. the small states. It'll be, it's like he's looking into a crystal ball. He said it'll be the states with slaves and the states without slaves, even though all 13 states had slavery. You know, Massachusetts is going to be the first one to eliminate them early on, very early on. Uh, or eliminate slavery. So you've got that. And I think that, you know, uh, referencing Holt's book, by 1850, it was too entrenched. I mean, to, it's just entrenched right down that Mason-Dixon line, if you want to go that way. Uh, but, you know, they kind of kicked the can down the road. I think the framers probably would have been surprised that it took as long. They saw it dying out. But, of course, they didn't see the uh, invention of the cotton gin, uh, and they didn't understand the, the money that was going to be made. And you can look at the numbers of enslaved people from the from the founding era up until that time period, and it grows from and what, and, and the and the and the rise of national parties too that yes. really complicates that division yeah. too. Go ahead, Mike. I just want to add that um, that in addition to being founders, um, these gentlemen um, they were all gentlemen at the time were politicians, and politicians by their nature are short term thinkers. So I would have our students think about to the extent that they were thinking about the future, I think maybe more so than other groups of politicians we've had, they spent time thinking about the future. But I also think that they were just thinking about, you know, how are they gonna win the next policy decision? And how are they gonna win the next Congress? And how are they gonna, you know, get what they want? Um, to the extent that, you know, do our politicians today know the consequences of not doing anything on climate change? I think they do, but does that change their short-term sort of decision-making process on what's best for their own political interests right now? It doesn't. And so I think to some extent, the students have to be careful of thinking the founders are any different than normal politicians that we've seen in every era, just seeking political power. And that's a very short-term political game. So Mike, Chris, Mike referenced, uh, he made a statement about cycles. And I, I believe, I don't know for sure, that he's referencing Arthur Schlesinger's uh, work, The Cycles of American uh, History there. Uh, and I was a big firm, I thought Schlesinger laid out a really good argument about that, but in my lifetime, I don't think I've seen that, that progressive bubble, Mike, that he talked about, uh, you know, we go to the progressive era, then the New Deal era, then the 1960s. I hesitate to say that any time since then have we had one of those progressive elements, but one of the first, obviously, was post-Civil War Reconstruction and what is commonly known as the Civil War Amendments. Uh, Chris, what I'm curious about is, is they, they passed the 13th Amendment and it gets rid of slavery, which is obviously one of the core issues. 
why did they find it what, what was the necessity of the 14th and 15th? I mean, once you ban slavery, you know, everything, all the problems are taken care of, aren't they? Oh, uh, no, no, I not hardly at all, because you have these 4 million people that I just spoke of, the formerly enslaved people. And, um, the, you know, in a strange kind of way, they are out, even with the, even with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, and here we are, the, the, the day that we celebrate Juneteenth, right, which is the day, hopefully students have heard about Juneteenth by now, that uh, it is a national holiday. Um, that is the day enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, found out that they were actually free, and that was at the close of the Civil War. So you've taken these 4 million or so people that had been enslaved, and we knew prior to that they were considered property in the South. And now the 13th Amendment is ratified in 1865, and they're no longer property. They're people, but they're not inside the Constitution courtesy of, uh, of the Dred Scott decision and uh, Justice Taney. Um, so you have to do something to bring them into the Constitution, right, to, to establish their personhood or, as we know, their citizenship. So you certainly need the 14th Amendment to do that because for that year and a half time period that, that the 13th Amendment was ratified, but the 14th is not, you still have the, like, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 uh, which is a very interesting piece because it really lays out the groundwork for the 14th Amendment. And even though Johnson, Andrew Johnson vetoes it, I think it's, a, I, you guys might want to check me on this, but I think it's the first time that uh, Congress overrides a presidential veto on major legislation. And that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 becomes the framework for the 14th because now we're trying to get these people inside the Constitution, so to speak. We're trying to make them um, citizens of this country, and we see that in the very opening sentences of the 14th Amendment. Is it fair to say that um, the, 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 uh, all these black codes uh, had a role in, uh, in making the 14th necessary? They, I mean, okay, slavery is outlawed, but the, many of these southern states, um, in defining what uh, free slaves could do, where they could work, uh, where they could worship, what, I mean, did they have any rights? And the answer, th these were very, very restrictive, and it came perilously close to being slavery by another name, these black codes. So I think um, uh, we, maybe we can put some examples of these in, in, uh, in the resources. And I think people will see that, like, man, that <laughs> we need a 14th Amendment because the 13th's not doing a whole lot. Uh, for newly freed slaves under the emancipation. Well, and the other problem with the 13th, and I don't know if students have seen, there's a great documentary on Netflix called 13. It's about the 13th Amendment. And the language in the 13th, the last, the latter part of the language in the 13th comes right out of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. The Northwest Ordinance outlaws slavery in the territories, except for the same language that you find in the 13th for people that have been duly convicted of a crime which go, coupled with the black codes that Tim just mentioned, um, it's easy to reestablish, as Tim says, slavery by another name. You could get arrested for being a vagrant and therefore you go to jail and a local guy comes and pays your bond and now you've got to go work for him to pay off your bond. Well, if we think about the myriad of ways that the 14th Amendment, you know, puts in motion, change that uh, will hopefully lead us to get closer to these ideals of the Declaration. Uh, the number of clauses in the 14th, and check me if I've, I've missed one, uh, obviously citizenship clause, there's the privileges and immunities clause, there's the due process clause, the equal protection clause, the no state clause uh, there. So at least five different elements that are going to potentially lead uh, to uh, uh, significant change in our constitutional and political order. Uh, uh, did I miss any? Is there uh, any other element? There's a voting rights. In That's the in the 15th, yeah. No, in the 14th. The, oh, there is the 14th. Oh, so, yeah. okay. Go ahead, Chris. I, I think five. Section yeah. 5, I think Section 5 is worth noting because it essentially is, is kind of Congress in a way saying um, it's kind of like the necessary and proper clause in the 14th. Uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th all say that Congress has the, uh, has the power and authority to, to pass um, legislation to achieve the objectives 
contained in this amendment. I mean, that's a broad, I mean, in a way, it's kind of self-dealing. So I think that clause merits some attention in terms of your question, did it alter? It has tremendous possibility to alter the relationship between national and state, because if Congress wants to pass something and they can and they can uh, slap a rationale on their legislation, yeah, uh, they can look a, at Section 5. It's a dependent clause, isn't it, though, in the sense that Sure. It's got, like you say, it's it's kind of a new version of the necessary and proper clause, right. in that they can they they can you know use their power to you know enact and enforce all of the other tools, whether it's citizenship or due process, equal protection there. But I would agree with you, uh, at least for a period of time in our history, Section Five. I, I don't know if that would be true today. Uh, that uh, you know, or it would depend on the language that Congress uses if it would pass muster in this current Supreme Court. I want to throw, uh, uh, David, let me throw a couple of things in here too, real quickly. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure, the enforcement clause in Article 5, but also not only it goes to the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution, but it also goes to McCulloch v. Maryland and the language that Marshall uses in McCulloch in establishing national supremacy and fast forward to a Taney decision in Prig, Prig v. Uh, Pennsylvania, or Pennsylvania Prig, Prig, I forget what it is, is which was uh, actually, um, Pennsylvania had a law uh, about fugitive slaves, and the Supreme Court says, sorry, the national law trumps your state law, and the fugitive slave clause in the Constitution trumps your law in the state of Pennsylvania. So Mr. Prig, who was a slave, a slave catcher, uh, was uh, not, he was found not guilty, but that language to establish uh, national supremacy, if you will, goes through McCullough and Prig. You know, what I, in my, you know, uh, period of thinking this last uh, week. Uh, <laughs> Was you know, that a long I, period? Was that a short yeah, period? Yeah, it seemed to be a long, uh, long week uh, for some reason. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, thinking about this concept of, of change uh, and that it seems to me that we just recycle the same arguments over and over again that developed at Philadelphia, obviously pre-Philadelphia in ratification. And you know, today we're still having, at least there are a, 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 a significant number of people that, that lead to a debate over the 14th Amendment. And uh, you know, uh, especially our great state of Texas, uh, there they want the Supreme Court decision Plyler versus Doe uh, reversed. Uh, that deals with uh, rights, I guess, if you want to say that, of, of immigrants, uh, uh, including those who are here as undocumented. And then another one that I keep hearing coming out of one of our political parties is to end the concept of birthright citizenship. So, Professor Williams, I, I am wondering, it's, is there, do you see a controversy with, with birthright citizenship is it an implied notion? Is it specific, a literal notion? Uh, uh, you know, and you know, I mean, is there a valid justification to maybe argue that it's not part of our constitutional way of life? Hmm. Let, let me start with this for the students, and I know that they may know this, um, or the teachers watching. <clears throat> but before the Fourteenth Amendment, before the the phrase you're bringing up, there was no definition of who was a citizen in the United States other than it being left up to the states or left up to Congress through naturalization acts, right? So our first naturalization act of 1790 defined, defined a, invited any free white males to come, right? So the fort, like we, we had this history of being like xenophobic in terms of who we would allow to be a citizen until the 14th amendment, right? And the 14th amendment, as we know, overturned Dred Scott by saying that all persons like born or naturalized in the US and subject to the jurisdiction there are, are citizens, okay? That seems pretty clear on its face. I think that it seems pretty clear that most of those debating the 14th Amendment, now there weren't a lot of Southerners in those debates, <laughs> would have agreed what they meant here. But to get to kind of where we started, um, if we accept at the, at the beginning that the Constitution is a living document, then is there, an, is there an argument to be made? I think, the, I think that there is an argument to be made on what does subject to the jurisdiction thereof mean, right? I think up till now, the Supreme Court and federal courts have been clear 
that that applies to non-citizens. It applies to people who are here visiting as tourists. It applies to people who are here illegally. It applies to their, their children. Does that mean that there won't be an argument in the next 20 years about what that means? I think that the nature of our republic means that we could have those debates. I, I think that the legislative constitutional history, the way it's been interpreted, to get back to your point, David, like living up to our founding document of the Declaration of Independence, we should be very inclusive with who we say are citizens, right? Whether in 30 years, this would be reinterpreted by a new court and say, no, in 1866, in the legislation that was passed, the civil rights legislation, it talked about no enemies, like you couldn't be an enemy, right? And that meant that you had to have allegiance only to the United States. And that meant if you were a citizen of any other country, you couldn't claim that allegiance. Could that argument be made? Sure. Do I think that it's the most persuasive argument? No. But I'm not well, willing to say like, we just have to take these words and they have to remain static because then I'm then I'm with Scalia and I'm not going to be with Scalia on that, even though if it opens up to some debate that maybe I don't agree with. Well, I think one of Scalia's issues is is in the actual writing and the motivation. This is about the newly established freedmen. All right. And that's who they're talking about, as you said, historically states determined who citizens were and obviously historically. Uh, and even contemporarily to those uh, who drafted the 14th Amendment, the issue was clearly about you know, the, free, the newly established freedmen and giving them citizenship rights. Yeah. But there was no contemplation of, of immigrants, uh, especially those who were not documented. Now, I don't know, what it, you know if they would have had documented immigrants in 1868 uh, as of yet. But from Scalia's point of view, there's the stretching of the 14th Amendment beyond the original intent of those who drafted it to now include those who are here illegally. All right. Uh, I know you partly don't agree with that, but does that, you know, there is some logic to that. Uh, uh, well, Scalia, Scalia, let me interrupt here, because Scalia being the originalist, if you would actually go back to read what John Bingham, the author of the 14th Amendment said, is clear that he intended it to apply to all people. Regardless, he said, under what's, I, I, I can't I always remember this phrase, but it's so poetic. No matter what, under what sky you were born or what air you breathe, if you're born, it, it, it's like if, if the idea of when it talks about the all persons, that should apply to everybody. And they were cognizant of uh, Native Americans because they were dealt with in the Constitution as a separate entity. They're not necessarily under the jurisdiction of the state. They're not going to be citizens until 1925, right, with the Indian Citizenship Act. And they're also aware of kids that uh, may be born here that are kids of diplomats or diplomats themselves from other countries. So we had had, uh, you know, people from other countries as diplomats here. So they understood that. Uh, there, That's why under the jurisdiction thereof, I know that people in the past want to make a big uh, stink about that. But I believe Juan Kim Ark of 1898 is still good law. And for those, uh, it's U.S. v. Wong Kim Ark. Uh, it establishes the birthright citizenship uh, in the Supreme Court, 1898. Kids, look it up. It's a good case to know. I, I can't help but think that the court itself, like if you don't like, if you don't like how the 14th Amendment has has been broadened out beyond its original targeted audience. Um, I can't help but think that the court is uh, the culprit because some of the first expansion uh, of rights beyond, uh, you know, newly freed slaves are corporations uh, through a very series of very creative uh, uh, court decisions that defines corporations as people. And, uh, and so therefore they fall under the 14th Amendment's meaning of person. Uh, so, so the court itself, and I think these cases were in the 70s and uh, 1870s and 80s. So the court itself expands the meaning of the 14th Amendment originally to mean corporate rights in a way. And then later on, the, 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 the individual rights revolution of the 14th Amendment, as, as I understand it, starts in the 20th century. So the court itself, I think, is culpable on, 
on this expansion question that you're asking. Well, David. and there's an irony here too, because Tim, you're mentioning these cases like uh, uh, Cruikshank in 1876 from the Colfax massacre. Uh, you're looking at uh, uh, obviously the slaughterhouse cases um, and you get to the civil rights cases uh, uh, decided in 1783. Um, and 1883. Eight, yeah, thank you. Eight, yeah. Thank you. Wrong century. <laughs> Can't imagine I would do that. Uh, 1883. <laughs> and you see the court moving away from what Bingham and, and uh, Jacob Howard, the, the author of the 14th Amendment, uh, a senator from Michigan, Bingham was a congressman from Ohio. Um, they, the, the, these court decisions are moving away from the expansion of rights as intended under the 14th. And yet for corporations, as Tim mentioned, they're fine with that. Um, I think it's Santa uh, Santa Clara County is the classic there. Yeah. So corporations are people, my friend, to quote uh, uh, Senator Romney. I, I just want to add two more things. If, if you were to argue that um, we don't, that subject to the jurisdiction thereof does not apply to an illegal person here um, and then to their child, would that logic extend then that none of the laws apply? Like, then they are not under the jurisdiction at all. They can't be charged with any crime. They would just have to be sent back to where they came. I don't think that would be a consistent line of thinking. So I think that's one thing I wanted to bring up. And in my research, I came across a case that I'm sure you all have heard of, but I didn't. It's a federal case, not a, a U.S. Uh, uh, Supreme Court, Reagan v. King, that had to do with whether Japanese citizens during World War II could retain their citizenship if they were born here. And the court said yes. And we all know what happens <laughs> to rights during times of war. So to me, that, that's, that case was decided in 1943 at a federal level, decided that yes, Japanese citizens who were born here, we can't, you know, they're still citizens, even though <laughs> they're a country that they're affiliated with is going to war against, I think it speaks highly about what courts have said about this amendment. Well, it seems to me the most radical change uh, and whether or not it was it was intended to I improve uh, the American constitutional arrangement is, is maybe debatable, uh, is its impact on the federal system. Uh, Chris, could you kind of describe how the 14th Amendment uh, alters the federal system of government? Well, it doesn't for a long time. That's a frustrating thing uh, with the, the cases that I had just mentioned. Um, you know, uh, going going back, they they move the court moves away from I believe the intentions. Of, having read uh, some of this stuff, uh, I think they, the court moves away from the intentions of the framers of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, so I don't know that it actually changes much at all, especially after the election of eighteen seventy six and uh, the period of recon, reconstruction as we know it is over. Um, you you know. Uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't change that relationship because now the north has reached across the bloody chasm and shook hands with the south and said y'all come back in and uh the gains that uh the um african americans had made during that brief window and that promise that was held out kind of flew out the window with court interpretations and establishment of home rule back in the south so we're not going to really see that uh, until we start talking about incorporation uh, of the four, uh, the Bill of Rights uh, in 1925 in, in Gitlow v. New York. So it really doesn't change that. Um, it doesn't change it much for a long time. Well, I, I understand that, that it's evolutionary rather than revolutionary, which has a lot to do with Reconstruction uh, and uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, again, like so much of America, we're not a nation that naturally looks backwards uh, you know, it's just better. Well, we, you know, okay, we like we're to, done. We, we like to pretend that we do. Uh, well, we don't pretend very well, uh, uh, to be quite honest. So I'll grant you that, that there's no immediate change. But in an evolutionary process, as you said, starting the 1920s, where we now start to see using Section 5 as well as uh, the other clauses yeah, um, I'll, I'll, you, you I'll, would I'll, agree that in the in the last you know or you know, last hundred years, yes. at least for most of that, uh, there was a profound change well, on we, the federal system. Yeah, we um, 
one of the things uh, we came up with in my class a few years, a number of years ago now, said so we end up calling the 14th Amendment Madison's Revenge. And that was, a, that was a term that I coined. So I was pretty proud of that because, you know, Madison had tried to get the national veto over state laws. He tried to get the body of the Constitution, was not successful at the convention, tried to get it into his uh, Bill of Rights, which wasn't called the Bill of Rights originally, uh, was not successful there. So finally, through the doctrine of incorporation, which is, we, we can argue that, whether or not they screw the pooch on that, but um, through the doctrine of, of uh, incorporation and protecting citizens from the abuses of state governments using the 14th Amendment as well, now you have a, na a national veto, usually through the courts, uh, to strike down state laws, which goes back to that national supremacy in Article 6 and the Supremacy Clause, channeling the language of prig channeling channeling the language of mccullough and the necessary and proper clause so yes it does it does is the fat kid on the teeter-totter for sure I mean, the fat kid jumps on the teeter-totter and the, yeah. uh, <laughs> so i didn't want to speak out because i didn't want to be that fat kid uh in our yeah, scenario I was, I was gonna say uh, uh, that cut a little close there chris <laughs> my bad so Mike, uh, mike's the only one of the four of us that didn't take that personally oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's still he's still uh, smelt young and uh, young and slim, young and slim. So, Professor Moore, uh, just because again we're looking at maybe some some general things for students and teachers to think about uh, regarding the issues uh, uh, presented in the We the People text, and yeah, and again, Chris has touched on a little bit, and it's about citizenship. All right, if you could briefly just you know. Why wasn't there a national definition of citizenship in uh, in the con the original Constitution? Uh, and I think more importantly, I, I again I was wondering about this. Can you truly be considered a citizen if you cannot vote? And 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 it it, it doesn't that defy some of the revolutionary arguments that were being made in the 1760s, 1770s about virtual representation that I am a woman, I am a citizen according to the law, am I not, and maybe I'm wrong here, yet I can't vote, you know, it, it, representation is dependent about some male in my family. So I know that's you know, probably too, too broad, but why did they leave it up to the states? Uh, and can, you know, what's the, can you be a citizen and not have the right to vote? Uh, oh, certainly. I mean, there are certain people that know that I don't think any anybody in this uh, discussion wants to write, have them to vote. I mean, seven year olds. Uh, so I, I think there's uh, well, maybe some 37 year olds, too. But uh, but I, I don't know that voting automatically equates uh, citizenship automatically equates to voting. I think um, I mean, even in the in the theorists lock and. And even Aristotle make the point that um, that uh, that kid that's that's a fool's errand to try to uh, to make that Venn diagram you know to to make that synonymous. Uh, but to your other your um, and may, maybe I, I'm I'm kind of dismissing that maybe because uh, I, I want to go to the other question. <laughs> uh, why and this is this is the classic dilemma of American history. Why they leave so much up to the states? And I think uh, why was there no national voting policy is because states had so many varied policies up to this point. They had all kinds of, of uh, there, there was no way that that constitution could have been passed if there was a national voting policy because the states had different, there's a graduate, you know, in some states you could vote for governor, you had to have X number of acres or, or personal wealth. I mean, it just, there were all kinds of voting procedures and policies in place. So there's no way they could have got that constitution through given that. The other, and also you combine the fact that states bristled so much at the mere mention that the federal government could interfere with their time, place, manner of their elections. There is no way if they, <laughs> that was, that was troublesome enough to anti-federalists. Just the mere threat of the national government stepping in and, and overseeing their, their federal elections. So the reason is twofold. There's too much there's too many variations of voting procedures. And second of all, there's no way they could have got it through. So that no leads me to conclude we're a faux union. We're not a union. 
even though that was the intention, as you said in our last oh, segment man. of the Oh, man, now you're going to make, you're gonna make me no. – I got to – here's the there's, cliche, there, there's David. No car, right. If there's no uniformity in the most fundamental issues of a constitutional republic, and we're going to let, you know, 13 up to 50 sovereigns decide so many things, or at least up till the 14th Amendment, I forget how many states at that time, uh, you know, uh, there is no uniformity. There is nothing that binds us together then as a nation. Well, that's the dilemma of American history. We have this thing called state. We have these things called states and we have this thing called a nation. And we're, we we're, we're, I, you know, we're a federal republic. I mean, I'm going to use a cliche there and now you can have at it, but that's, that's the dilemma. Yeah, it's it's a dilemma, or it's uh, you know part of the list of lies my teacher told me, uh, well, that kind of thing. I, I mean, well, but it, you it, you want you want a uniform system. We're not we're not a unitary system. In in Tim's defense, too, I don't think you know you would have got it, much like uh, the issue of slavery and compromise. The compromises that were made, or the can that was kicked down the road until, gosh, uh, eighteen fifty in, in bloody Kansas. Um, they did the same thing, and we're still dealing with the, that can being kicked down the road, which is no national uniformity when it comes to voting. We'll leave it up to states, right? And so therein lies a problem. And you can see this in the, at the founding era. You know, you got Hamilton writing in favor of some national, you know, some national program for figuring out elections, and you've got anti-federalists that are absolutely opposed, so vehemently opposed to that whole concept. Um, you find an article in section four of the constitution. So, and you're not going to, plus there's the, the, just the practical nature. States had already been running elections. They've been running elections for a long time. You got this brand new national government. We, we got to get, we can't even figure out where the capital is going to be, let alone how we're going to run a national election. Well, and, so and again, like, let the states do it. It's, it's, it's what we're presented with today, partly Chris. And I, I have no problem with the states having their own system for state offices, but when it right. comes to federal offices, you know, it would seem it would seem logical that they would mandate uniformity, which, oh. as we know, they still really haven't. Or, or there was a brief period where they attempted to, but now you've seen that chiseled away. Uh, right. The Voting Rights Act being undermined in many ways by this current court twice, uh, at least. Yeah, so like I said, I'm, I'm wondering if this is just, uh, you know, for consumer taste and make us feel better that we're the United States of America. No, we're not united in most of what we do uh, uh, there. And, and again, I said a long time ago that the framers punted, you know, uh, uh, and maybe they had faith in the future generations, but they definitely punted on a lot of the key issues that have been consistent problems in our territory known as the United States and our problems today, you know? Well, we, uh, we are again, united as... We are united in a commercial sense because I expect uh, when I go into a restaurant in, uh, in Wisconsin, in a restaurant, in wherever, that there's some kind of standard of cleanliness. Uh, I, you know, so w commercially we are very united because there is an expectation of, of similarity or, or exactness in many of our commercial interactions. I mean, I think 48, maybe 49 states have these equity, commercial equity laws where it's all standardized. So in an economic sense, I think, it, and it's easier to get that done than it is say culturally or, or uh, with elections and politics. So, but there is a United States of America commercially uh, to a large extent, not perfectly, but I think that, um, I think there, there's an argument to be made there. Yeah, I, there is definitely an argument to be made. But, you know, talking about this, these cycles and uh, this constancy of dealing with the same issues, uh, Mike, right. we still continue to argue about voting. And, and again, the Texas uh, GOP this last weekend uh, voted to uh, uh, remove the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They'd like to get rid of that historic piece of legislation. Why, in your opinion, has this been a consistent challenge to this, this country? Uh, the idea of voting rights uh, and making sure that every eligible citizen can vote. Why is that? That's, again, it's, we're 2022, and here we are having major debates over voting 
just like they were back in the 18th century. Why is that? Yeah, I'd go back to something I brought up earlier. I think that um, <clears throat> the pursuit of political power in politics is a is it's a short term game, right? So every politician wants their voters to come out to vote and wants the other side's voters to not come out to vote. That's been from the beginning. And I think that <clears throat> there is, um, I, I don't think we should expect anything less in a democracy. It's just the way it's gonna be, that, that those with power are gonna do what they can within the law and the constitution, and sometimes with outside those bounds, to get the votes that they want. And there's a calculation that's done, right? So right now, the way the, the political parties are set up, it's the calculus is that if Democrats can get more non-whites to vote, it's better for them in their pursuit of political power. For the Republicans after the Civil War, their calculus, if they could get more freed Blacks to vote, it was better for them. And as the political winds shift, those self-interests shift. I mean, what's what's frustrating, I mean, that, so that's the politics of it, I think. But I, I agree with you to some extent, Dave, what, what you were just arguing. To be a union, what are the, what is the consensus on some of the most basic principles, right? And if we are gonna be a federal democratic republic, should we not at least have a consensus on who has the right to vote and how elections are held for every single eligible voter in the United States? We don't, right? There's, and those fights go all the way down to the county level as we know, right? I just think that's the framework we have. It's not the framework we have to have. I think our constitution provides those spaces for us to fill that in, to have a national sort of voting law if, if there was the political power to enact it. I you mean, mean something like the Voting Rights Act? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I mean... I it was a hundred. It was a hundred-year battle. But if we go from the Fifteenth Amendment to the Voting Rights Act, it, we should have then, you know, cleaned our hands and said, "Okay, we fixed it. We now, we now, under law, it requires some uniformity it, it, there." But you know, ever since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, there's been that political faction out there that's tried to chip away. And and to be quite honest, in this day and age, they've been rather successful uh, at that. So. You know, again, I, I think we, we, we attempted to solve it. I think we achieved the legislative, you know, uh, agenda to solve that. But here we are, those forces have chipped away at it and we're still having the same, the same arguments. Uh, you know, and, and the, the, you know, the, the tongued, uh, you know, uh, uh, element of, uh, tongued, is that, that's not the word, a forked tongue, uh, elements of American politicians of praising the system and we're the greatest democracy in the world while simultaneously coming up with ways to limit uh, the ability to vote. Uh, you know, it, 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 it shocks the rest of the world. I mean, the rest of the world just, they look at us and, and especially I've been reading a lot of international perspectives. Uh, I, think, I don't know if it was Pew, but someone just put out a, a recent study on how the world views us. And a lot of them is, a lot of the comments that they presented is the world looks at us and even Canadians, you know, who have a similar history to ours, they kind of go, what is wrong with you people? And, you know, maybe it's, you know, Chris and Tim, you're right. Is it that notion of maintaining the sovereign integrity of the states, you know, has been the boil on our behind uh, since 1789 uh, there. So I do want to, I do want to shift uh, to, Probably, you know, what, what we started out this program is the major tool for change uh, over uh, the history of this country, and that is Article Three in the judiciary. Um, so, Tim, if I took a literalist point of view of the Constitution, the words and what they mean, could I not argue that there is no power of judicial review in the Constitution? Uh, no. Um, I think, and... Uh, you, there is a word in Article Three that I think is um, is an invitation for judicial activism. Actually, um, so I mean, it's, so if you took a literal, te uh, well, maybe I'm 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 conflating your word literalist with textualist. There's this word uh, that the court has equity jurisdiction, 
And uh, in England, that meant that judges exercised broad, broad powers of interpretation. Uh, equity judges, uh, that's just the way that English system works. So the many folks, when they, you know, you get, you know, is judicial review in the text? No, but the word equity is. And so that, uh, I, I mean, I learned this years ago when uh, we've mentioned Sue Leeson already, but she posed this question that re you really got to look into that. And if you look at the anti-federalists, when they are griping about the judiciary, they hone right in on that word equity. They're in, in about four or five Brutus essays. He looks at that word equity and sees exactly what it is, that there will be a broad power of interpretation. And for an anti-federalist, that's a problem. Uh, well, so, what's interesting, good. No, no. That, I mean, so to your point, if you're a literalist, I think you have to take that word equity seriously. Um, and it's there. Well, what's, what I find both interesting and somewhat humorous is that the Federalists argue that the judicial branch will be the weakest of all three branches. And as I now look back on American history, uh, part of me wondered, did they say that tongue in cheek? Uh, uh, or would they be surprised themselves at the power of federal courts, especially the Supreme Court, in both the 20th and well, 21st I, century? Uh, I, I don't have that Ouija board to be able to answer that question. But uh, I would say that the reason uh, – now, here's a cynical view of, of uh, weakest branch. Uh, Hamilton has to say that because, in my view, he is really getting taken to the woodshed by Brutus. Brutus is saying equity makes the court the most amongst the most and maybe the most powerful. So, uh, and remember, the Brutus essays occur before uh, 78, Fed 78. So I, I'm looking at this a little bit politically slash cynically. He has to say that because he knows Brutus is just beating him to a bloody pulp with his equity arguments. Well, I think plus if the framers were to look at where we are right now, uh, they would be shocked, I think, at how feckless Congress is. Because, yeah. they, you know, they, I mean, I, I think certainly Hamilton is doing a little CYA in Fed 78, uh, you know, in terms of arguing about the least dangerous branch. But I think if fast forward to two, two, 2022, and uh, if you brought these, you know, old dead white guys back and to take a look at what we're doing right now, they'd be like, well, why doesn't Congress do this? Why doesn't Congress do this? Why doesn't Congress do this? And we have a Congress that is so divided politically that they they can't do much of anything. I'm wondering part, of, part of that part of that I would blame the framers because I don't want to go off on a rant on majority minority control on things, but uh, part of it is the system in which they gave us. Mike, you were going to say? Yeah, I mean, I think David, I think you did a really good job of framing this from the beginning, and I, I'm seeing the. And this question to Tim about judicial review, I think, is part of this, this bigger, bigger argument, right? So I see that we're a country founded on this idea in the Declaration, right? This idea of all men are created equal. That's the big thing, right? The new idea, okay? And then there's the actual writing of the Constitution, which is kind of like, it's a marriage of like, oh, this is the best we can do right now. It's a compromise. It's the best we can do to keep everyone at the table. And, my, and, and part of that debate is this between the national government and state governments, right? So to me, everything after that, every debate is about that political compromise that we said last time we met kind of had to be made or we're going to get maybe not 13 different states. We're going to get maybe four or three or four. And then this commitment that we have on in writing to what kind of place we want to be that's different. And all of these debates come into judicial review. Marshall had an idea about national power that was one view that was different than what the anti-federals have. And Marshall had the power, Marshall put it in the play. And then we have, now we have judicial review. I, I don't know if what I'm saying is, it's probably not that aha moment for us. I'm just kind of thinking it's like you said, it's from the very beginning. It's been these, this same conversation that we've been having. I think Mike's point is really, uh, it, it made me think that uh, the ideals of the of the Declaration 
th there's certainly idealism in the declaration, the first two paragraphs. But to Mike's point, the bargaining, I can't help but think of the last paragraph. Uh, there's a real bargain going on in that last paragraph that there were <laughs> you know, separate and sovereign states. I mean, so there's that bargain again, even in a, a document that we focus so far on the ideals in the first couple of paragraphs. So one of the ideals in the declaration is this bar is this bargain uh, when it's articulated in the last paragraph. Well, another irony, and I'm curious what you guys think, is it seems to me that when the court in its history, you know, pushes, and I'll use the term progressive, all right, advancing the causes of democratic government, when, when they're in that business, that seems to be when they get the most pushback. And it, and it is, I guess it's not surprising. I don't know if you guys saw one of the latest studies. I try not to pay that much attention to political studies and polling and stuff like that in the recent day, but but the court ever since they've they've done this is at an all time low, uh, uh, you know, uh, affirmative feeling by the American people and trust in the institution uh, uh, there. Uh, and uh, and I read an op ed in which this so called legal scholar said it all originates with the court going beyond their jurisdiction. All right, in interpretation and he would argue legislating uh, from the, the bench and that it was do, they were doomed uh, to, uh, to lose the faith of the people by, by, by doing such decisions like Brown or Miranda uh, or, uh, or Burgerfeld and those cases that, that doomed them because that got them into the politics and policy issues in which allegedly they were not going to battle in. Did, what do you guys think about that? Smells like Southern Manifesto. <laughs> yeah. It really does to me the uh, the reaction to the to the Brown decision by I don't know 100 and 100 plus uh, congressmen. So I wonder if Texas is rattling hum lately can be framed like a new version of the Southern Manifesto. Chris, well, I, I think it goes back to my comment earlier that um, the court would not have to do that if Congress could step in and enact legislation that would say that hey, you know what. Um, we're going to repeal DOMA, uh, even though Windsor kind of did that. Um, and we're going to say that we're going to pass some type of legislation that would allow for same-sex marriage, or we're going to pass legislation that would allow for, uh, voting rights for all people. But, oh, wait, wait, wait we did that. I'm <laughs> sorry, I forgot. Uh, um, but you know, the idea of Congress steps in and it fills a void. I mean, if we, I've said this before, nature of boards a vacuum. And when Congress doesn't step in to use its power, then the courts have to come in and kind of clean up behind the parade, so to speak. And they're going to have to make that decision. Well, because, do they? You're well, saying they have to come in? Well, they don't I have to. I don't know to. that they have to. It's true, true. They but have. They have. They have. Right. So that you're right. They don't have to. But, you know, when we're looking for clarification, when the people are looking for clarification or they're looking for guidance or looking for someone to lead, and Congress doesn't lead, being the first branch of government, um, and then you have the opponents of the president's party. You know, whoever's not uh, holds a presidency is going to try and hold up everything the executive will try and do. And so you see the, the again the expansion of executive power uh, from the from the beginning. The courts are the kind of the people sweeping up behind the parade. So it is Mike. Yeah, my, my knowledge of this history is not on point, maybe, but to your point about there's been this pushback only when the court has acted and used in a progressive way. I would argue there was pushback in society and in politics after Dred Scott. There was pushback in society after, and I'm forgetting the court decision when basically the New Deal legislation was shut down and then FDR threatened to pack the court. Um, I think Schechter, was, and Schechter and Butler, I think. Yeah. So I, I don't agree with, I guess, your statement that it's only when it's been progressive. I think that's been more of the story of the mid 20th century, because that's what we're going through. I think we check back in in 25 years with each other, with a court that is leaning into providing more states with the ability to define what rights are, and to see what the pushback is after Americans live in that society for a while. So I think, and again, it's more emblematic that we are 
this diverse society with very different conceptions over um, what our founding principles are and should be. And I think that we continually, we have these debates at different times in history over different issues, but it's getting back to those fundamental questions of how much power should the national government have and who should be afforded rights? <laughs> and some would say, afford rights to everyone because it's all people. Some would say, no, that's not exactly what we mean. Some would say national government should have the power. And others would say, no, state should have the power. And as transgender bathrooms pop up as the issue or abortion, it's, it comes back to those root, root, um, I don't know, issues that we've never, we've never resolved. We've never resolved from the beginning. What was the thing you said with Schlesinger earlier? Um, what was um, the... Uh, the cycles of American politics. Cycles. I always go with that guy named Foucault. Foucault. What's his name? Foucault. The, the pendulum guy, right? Foucault. Mm -hmm. Foucault, yeah. I always tend to... I don't think it's cycles. I think it's a pendulum. I think the pendulum swings one way. And because it swings a certain way, then you're going to get a reaction to that. And there's a pushback, right? And then it pushes back again. And depending on whether it be progressivism or conservatism, um, you see a pushback based upon which way the pendulum starts to go. And we hope that when it goes, we hope when it goes too far in one direction, there's a strong enough pushback to bring it back to uh, some reasonable. Um, when, he's, when he's writing, part of his context is the overwhelming moderation of the American people that uh, most Americans are in the middle. I don't know if he anticipated, all right, that, that it, it, if not both political parties, but at least one political party has been hijacked by the extremists uh, there. I mean, again, and there's, there is some argument that the, that the far left has way too much power in the Democratic Party uh, mm, yeah. there to the point that, I mean, because in the last analysis, that pendulum the swing was going to diminish over time and it was going to find a sweet spot in the middle uh, uh, there. Uh, you know, and, and it's very similar to what Schlesinger said, that in the end, after a total cycle of the political system, we find ourselves in a moderate kind of situation uh, politically and constitutionally. Well, uh, Schlesinger missed the boat on where we are in terms of moderation. He, 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 he needs to be around now to see where we are, because if you think about well, this, this is crazy. Think about this. Well, he was a, his, who, go ahead. Who's, who's, we deal with the court. Who's the, who's the, who's the new Justice Kennedy on the court? It's Justice Kavanaugh, which is crazy because he is, he's, I mean, he, he really is far to the right on so many things, but he has become the new kind of swing kind of, kind of member of the court which is, tells you how much further the country has moved, or excuse me, a, a small a minority of the country has moved to the right. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, he wrote the book in the 1980s. And so as, you know, I, I tend to blame the framers unfairly for a lot of things. I, I think he was looking <laughs> back and seeing a pattern. And then of course he projected that, that therefore that pattern would continue on without anticipating um, uh, modern communication uh, systems, uh, techno technological change, which we know is a major contributing factor to a lot of the political mess that we are in. I don't know if he anticipated to such a degree that Congress would punt on their responsibilities and back off on doing a lot of things. And, and partly is, is I, that happened, partly because they did look to the courts you know, we leave this alone, the courts will fix it because yep. the courts, you know, since World War II seem to have been doing that and, and that became the norm. You now it's kind of like in, in California for a while, it's, it's toned down a little bit, but the state legislature in California, they backed away from a number of issues once we, we started to actively use the initiative process. And so major issues in California were be being decided by direct democracy through the initiative process and not so much the legislative process. And, and I think just, they're, go ahead. Well, I just wonder, is that just lazy legislators? Why, why, why sponsor a bill, all right, that is highly controversial and could cost you your seat? Which by the way, is what's happened to the national legislature, right? 
you know, we know, at least we're being told by a number of people that there are enough Republicans who want change or, or in, in gun laws, they want gun safety laws, but they're not going to go out on the limb. And we saw what happened to the senator from Texas this weekend. You know, one of the more conservative senators, he gets booed at the state convention because he's playing a major role in coming up with compromise legislation. You know, so a lot of members of Congress don't want to go out there on legislation that has, you know, significant meaning because of the, you know, the, the passions of, of the base in both parties is going to make them pay a price. And like I said, we, we've seen that. And I don't think Schlesinger in the 1980s, because we were nowhere close to where we are now, I don't think Schlesinger could have, have anticipated, uh, uh, you know, the changes that, that us boomers and even Mike, and I never remember if he's Gen X or whatever generation Gen X, uh, you know, again, I don't know if you know, in our lifetime, Chris, if we could have anticipated where we'd be here in 2022, you know, uh, given that we were probably, we were all, you know, affected by maybe the high point of American constitutional government uh, and, and progressive change to be much more inclusive uh, to now we're back. Like I said, we're, we're moving backwards in time as far as one major political uh, party uh, is uh, concerned there. Uh, Mike, I, I am wondering, how did, the, how did the framers design the court to try to make it as apolitical and removed from the passions and whims of the people? And do you think that they were once again uh, uh, overly ambitious, uh, overly trust, trusting of, of people in general? Uh, or, or did they do as good of a job as they could to isolate the court from the passions and whims of the fundamental political process? Yeah, let me add to the first part first. So for our federal courts, they obviously uh, federal judges don't run for election, they're appointed. Um, they're appointed by a combination of the president and the Senate. And at the time, the founders were thinking that the Senate, as we've said, is supposed to be this rational, moderate body that is going to like cool off the passions of the people. And then it allows um, um, justices and judges to serve as long as they want, as long as they can under, it's not life tenure, it's good, good behavior, right? During times of good behavior. So they kind of um, don't, yeah, I love it. <laughs> don't put them within the cycle of elections. So, you know, so that's, that's, that's how they intended to do it. I don't know. I think Tim could speak maybe more about um, what they were thinking at the time. I, I, I don't know of any other constitutions in the world that have come up with a better way to insulate, right? I think other countries actually try to find ways to make the justices at the national level um, more legitimate in terms of like having more uh, political actors have a say, right? Or to have more stakeholders have a say. Um, but to the extent that these, at the moment, nine members of at least the Supreme Court and the federal judges, um, they're human beings. <laughs> to the extent that they're still human beings, whether they have the robe on or off, I'm just a firm believer that they can within the their duties do their best to try to stay within the letter of either the law or the constitution but at the end of the day they are human beings and they're going to be influenced by their own philosophies their own understanding of history their own sort of um their own sort of interests i think to some extent so i, I don't think there's any way to structure a constitution to get around that unless we do what baseball's thinking about and come up with like uh robo empire robo umpires right um which um, I don't even know. Austin strikes, baby. Austin strikes. I'm in favor. Definitely in favor on uh, on that. But well, Mike, I, again, here's my sense, and and I think you're seeing a little bit more activity on on judicial reform. Um, I, I one had nothing to do with the current court. I've been an advocate for a long time that we expand the numbers on the Supreme Court just because of the growth in population. I mean, we've had what nine justices since the age of Lincoln. And that's and why is that a fixed number, you know? Uh, and again, in that time, we've quadrupled, if you know, at least our population. Uh, and we need more appellate districts. Uh, again, you look at the ninth district and how huge it is uh, there. But also, I, I, you know, I 
I remember when Robert Bork first wrote this, I, you know, I, I kind of <laughs> to him, uh, you know, but now I think term limits, so you can isolate, but I think term limits on justices is a good idea. Now, uh, well, uh, I, uh, I, I have to chime in here because I, I would say uh, the, the court has always been political. You, you look at some of those early appointments, even in the Washington administration, they were very, very political. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's been the case. I, I think there's, um, I think there's a little bit of good old days in your question, David, uh, you know, uh, that they were insulated from the politics way back in the day. I, I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, no, I think the, dif the difference, I'm, uh, the difference I would say, I mean, cause think about this political i mean what's senatorial courtesy i mean <laughs> how political can you be if, if for a while there you just reached out to a senator and asked who do you want and and uh you know and that's who who, who gets the nomination so i i mean there's always been vestiges of a very political court what i think is different and it's a wonderful little book um uh, i think it's called the confirmation mess uh, it's not very long, but basically the thesis is in the modern media world, and this kind of maybe starts with uh, Fortis in the 60s, um, and the, the role of, of the media and, and a certain style of investigative journalism, I think, plays. Uh, none of that was around in the early days, so I think we can easily conclude that it, was le you know, it wasn't as political. But uh, I think since the 60s and maybe the... Um, um, Fortis uh, and the collapse of his nomination um, and, and investigative journalism, I think, makes it look a lot. Uh, the politics is much more apparent, uh, I think, than uh, maybe in times past. I'm well, sorry, I, you, you, you were going to say something? Well, I, I you yeah, know, I. I, I don't believe I'm being, you know, rom or that I'm romanticizing the past. I mean, that's partly my point is and, and I once again I'm referring to the the world of textbooks you know and uh, and, and again this idea and it's presented in in every right. textbook I've ever seen you know well the court is an apolitical branch they are removed you know from the political process and well you sure that can't look at the 1790s and the Marshall Court as being removed from the political process. Uh, you know, and again, I don't know if there's, but I, I do believe that there, that, that we looked for certain characteristics, not necessarily ideology. We looked right. for judicial temperament and stuff. And, and, and again, I will say, I don't know that there'll ever be a case any longer. Maybe Souter uh, or, you know, or Kennedy, maybe they'll be the last ones you know, where they're nominated by one party, but once they get on that bench, yeah, they, they maybe become something else. Remember, Eisenhower nominates two, which he, he says at the end of his presidency, those were two of the biggest mistakes he ever made right. because right. they were part of an emerging, you know, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, liberal or progressive sure. constitutional uh, thinkers uh, uh, there. I don't know if we'll ever see that. Uh, I, you know, again, I can't anticipate. It. I don't know if Kavanaugh turns out to be like a suitor uh, there. Uh, that would shock me. Um, you know, so, I, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not overly romanticizing. I'm frustrated by the way those who are in, who have the power of communicating our constitutional uh, arrangement and how it's presented to young people. And a lot of it is exceptionalism and, and very much romanticizing the American Constitution and a lot of mythologies built into it. Uh, but that's, that's a different, that's not the question, that's not the question you ask. I mean, you, you're right. I, I agree 100% uh, with your assessment of how it's communicated in, uh, in textbooks. But uh, the, the question was, was it, was it different in the, old, in the, in the uh, was it the good old? Well, so. no, my question was, did they achieve their goal to, to move the court as far away from the political process uh, uh, there, because that was obviously their goal in the design of, of, right. of Article Three and the federal courts, you know, and-, and I, think, right. I, I, mean, I think that, okay, I think it's a good question. And I think that um, 
um, I think students could think about what would be the most effective way to do that, right? <laughs> I mean, would it be to take, okay, do we say we want a certain caliber, caliber training of people, current judges? Do we put all their names in a, in a bowl and then we pull out nine and those who serve? That would be very non-political. But then we'd have to ask, okay, that's effective in being out of the political process, but is it effective with some other measures we want to have? I think it's a, I think it's a useful thing for students to think about. And I think you're absolutely right. The way even college students are presented this or what college students think about this is that the court is some magical branch that is not at all involved in politics and shouldn't be and um, protected by it when we know that's not the case. But I would counter that and say, I don't know if I'd want a court that was completely removed from the political process because they're making decisions that are about power and that power is gonna affect my daily life. Um, um, to get back to what President Obama said when he was searching for his first justice, that he wanted a justice that had empathy. And remember all, everyone saying, oh, what does he mean empathy? And I, I thought, that's great. Like I want someone in those, those, uh, in, in those positions of power to think about how their decisions affect people like me. So I think it just depends on what, you, what your metric is. And if it's out of the political process, sure, there are other things they could have done. Like you wouldn't get the Senate involved or the, the president involved. But um, I don't think that should be the only measure of what an effective court should be. All right, gentlemen, we're kind of coming up to the uh, end here. And uh, so like we did last week, this is a, this is a challenging unit because it, uh, you know, unlike unit one to some degree and definitely unit two, there's not this consistent theme throughout there. I mean, the, the theme is change. All right. Uh, that's, that's the question of, of the unit, but you got to deal with the 14th amendment, the 15th amendment. Uh, you've got to deal with uh, 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 judicial review uh, and voting and parties uh, as and, and such uh, there. So uh, what insights uh, about unit three uh, would you like to share with students and teachers as we come to an end, Chris? Um, I think that the period post-Civil War, 18, I'll go to 1865, the end of the war up until uh, the end of the century is probably one of the more overlooked periods of history. Um, there's so much going on in that time frame, and we had there's so much promise. You know, we, we fight this bloody, bloody, bloody civil war. You know, uh, all to decide what kind of nation we're going to be. And it doesn't take long after that for us to be regressive again to move away from these ideas. And I love the idea. And Tim and, and I think Mike mentioned it, and Tim mentioned it. But you know, we finally take the, the, some of the beauty of that idea of the Declaration of Independence. And we finally, is the 14th Amendment is the bridge to the Declaration of Independence because it's the first place, it's the first time in the Constitution other than Tim's word equity in Article 3 that we actually talk about equality under the law. And we see through court decisions, uh, slaughterhouse especially in privileges and immunities, um, we, we regress. And so I think the beauty of this chapter, it gets you into a, a time frame that really, I think, is pivotal and overlooked in American history. And I would challenge students as well as teachers to, to, to not overlook this time period, because I think it, it sets the course for so much of what we're dealing with today in terms of um, uh, equality under the law for all persons. Professor Moore. I think... Uh... I, I think Chris's point, as he was talking about this, uh, the C word uh, change, um, I think that's why this unit is so uh, scary. Uh, because I think, as uh, Mike's earlier point, that there's, or I think maybe, maybe David, you said it, there's an inherent conservatism in the American culture uh, status quo. And the fact that we have this uh, organic evolutionary change in our constitutional system makes things very difficult for a culture that, that is really kind of steeped in status quo. So it's a challenging, it's a very challenging unit, perhaps the most challenging because 
you know, the, the, fir the, uh, the previous units, like how we got this system, but we, and that, you know, there's some great stories in there, but the, where it really, really rubs people is the element of change, how much or how little or regressive. I mean, let's not fool ourselves that the, the arc of justice bends always towards justice, uh, the arc of history. Uh, I mean, there's regressive change as well. And, and I think that's, uh, we've talked about that a lot too in this last hour and a half. So the, the idea of change in this unit is really a challenge, but it also, it, as a historian, I think it's fantastic because the stories in a story of change are just remarkably complex and interesting. Mike? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I would just add that for me, this unit really focuses on I would say the opportunities for change at an institutional level. So whereas unit one's about the ideas, unit two is about the framework of the constitution. This is about those other institutions, um, how they have changed over time and um, the opportunities that provides for larger societal and political change. So I think that by the time we get to unit six, we can start to explore how does an everyday citizen take advantage of the 15th Amendment? How does an everyday citizen or how have political elites changed the interpretation of the 15th Amendment to leave out certain ordinary citizens, right? So I think, I think the way the textbook is designed is it's, we're still at a higher level, like we're still talking about amendments and judicial review and stuff, um, but it's critical because as Chris said, this period, during the Civil War and after, um, it opens up opportunities for citizens that were not there previously. And it opens up opportunities for politicians that were not there previously. The, the heartbreak for me is that you can see the end of the movie after the 14th and 15th Amendment and be like, that's it, it's a cut, end of the movie, and they lived happily ever after. But it's not, it's really the beginning of a different movie. It's about the pushback against those changes. Um, but it's still at that institutional level that's, that's getting, I think, everyone primed for thinking about what's gonna happen in unit six, which is the best unit in the textbook. So let's go. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> what a shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, students and teachers, uh, like, like I said in our last session, um, <laughs> It is fascinating to me, and, and again, this week of reflection and thought on uh, that I, uh, you know, that I involve myself with. It, it, it's just so fascinating to me. Uh, it's like uh, again, this this uh, Texas uh, uh, convention this weekend. Um, they they passed overwhelmingly uh, uh, the idea that their their state retains the right of secession, uh, and uh, I, I had to chuckle. Uh, uh, partly because I, again, like Mike said, I thought that was resolved, uh, yet it isn't. Uh, and so as you go through this unit, uh, it's important that you get the foundation uh, of, of, of the issues that are presented. But uh, I, I do believe you really need to work on connecting it to the world you inhabit. Uh, and uh, that uh, you're able, after your studies, to make uh, a, a good argument about those issues of, of the 14th Amendment, due process, citizenship, equal protection, you know, uh, and, uh, and voting and, and voting rights, that you're able to connect to the issues that we are confronting uh, today. So that brings us to the end of uh, uh, session three for our summer program. When we meet next, we're going to be focusing on the institutions, Congress, the presidency, uh, and uh, I don't know if federalism is an institution. Uh, Federalists, I know Federalists should have been institutionalized or anti-Federalists. One of them should have been institutionalized, but federalism will be part of that uh, discussion. So until that time, uh, have a wonderful beginning of the summer. Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.